Good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. And we are continuing our discussions on, sorry, we're just admitting coach, um, continuing our discussions on H18 and actually relating to sexual exploitation of children. Um, when we last were working on this bill, we, uh, uh, there are points of disagreement between the Attorney General's office and the Defender General's office, and we asked them to see if they could come to an agreement. And so I'm going to turn to David Scher first of the Attorney General's office to uh, to update us on uh, on where you are. So good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, for the record, David Scher with the Vermont Attorney General's office. We have had extensive discussions about uh, compromise language, and I won't bury the lead. We have not been able to uh, find a compromise um, that was acceptable to both sides. I did forward to the committee, I think through uh, Mike Bailey, through the committee assistant, um, some proposed language coming from our office. Um, which we were uh, in, I don't know if folks have had a chance to review it and we may um, need to speak again when you've had more of a chance to review it. Uh, and with that language, we tried to address some of the concerns, our office tried to address some of the concerns. Um, the Defender General's office, and I, I know Marshall's here and will speak uh, to his concerns shortly. Um, when we spoke last, they had mentioned um, including uh, making sure that the concept of actual child was uh, stated within the uh, statute, within the proposed statute. We, in this, in the attached proposal, um, or in the proposal that we recently forwarded along, uh, we, our office attempted to put into that proposal the concept of an actual child, basically the limitation the constitutional limitation is that you cannot criminalize possession of materials, simulated materials that are that are not a simulation that includes an actual real child. Um, the Defender General proposed something along the lines of uh, using the term um, actual child or actual person under the age of 16. Our office had a concern with that because our office is thinking of it in terms of the eventual statutory interpretation that will be utilized by a court. It's our office's view that the term, um, uh, or I should say the definition of a child right now, which is a person under the age of 16, is in fact a definition that uh, is about um, an actual child, like a real child, not a simulation, not a, or I should say not a digital representation, not a drawing, not a painting, something like that. If we were to put into the simulation definition um, something that said uh, an actual, added the term actual, an actual person under the age of 16 or an actual child or something like that, the concern on our end is that a court is going to have to look at that and say, well, what does the word actual mean? Courts like to make sure that every word, in fact, it's sort of like a canon of statutory interpretation, that every word uh, should have meaning. And, or, and that's a way of constraining courts so that they are interpreting the laws that were written by the legislature and not some other imagined version of the law. And so they try to give every word meaning. And the concern that our office has is that by adding an extra word to a definition that already refers to a real actual child, it will be uh, adding an element that our criminal division will be, uh, that our you know, prosecutors will be required to prove, uh, perhaps an element of higher specificity than is required constitutionally. Constitutionally, it is required that there be an actual real child who's the, the subject uh, who is within the simulation simulated image. Um, but it's not the case that there's some sort of high, high level of specificity like a identify like a known child, a child who is nameable, a child you can say this is the specific child that we are talking about. And the concern of our criminal division is that a court in interpreting language that adds another term uh, to the uh, already existing definition of a child, they will put meaning onto it that 
requires an element of proof that is not required uh, constitutionally. Um, that being said, we agree that the, we certainly are not disputing the constitutional limitation. Um, so the proposal that we came up with was to explain the concept of th that is embodied by the Ashcroft limitation. Ashcroft uses the word actual, the Ashcroft case uses the word actual to refer to a broader concept. And we tried to address both concerns, making sure that the concept of the constitutional limitation is in the definition of simulation without potentially having this um, unintended consequence of adding an element that is uh, unnecessary for, um, for the crime, for the establishment of the crime. Um, so the, as you, I don't know, hopefully you've been able to access it. Uh, yeah, actually, let's make, excuse me, Dave. Let's make sure that everybody does have um, have the language. It's it is posted, posted on you are, yeah, yeah. And um, and once everybody does get the um, the language, David, maybe if you could walk us through it, please. You, I know you've been speaking about, it, but if you could walk it walk us through it, I think that would be very helpful. That would be great. And um, also. Uh, um, I know Michelle has um, has sent us, and we can see it in the chat that um, the child means any person under 16 years of age. And then we also have a definition of person. And I know that um, that Michelle has advised, advised us that um, that we are talking about an actual child um, in this in this chapter. Um, I do see um, Martin and Selena. I do see your hands up. Do you? Do you want to go ahead while folks are getting the language, or what? I'm not sure what you're. No, I, you I, had a question, but up to you. Okay. All right. Well, go ahead, Martin, and then Selena. Well, well, it's just that haven't courts already been using the language "actual child" already? So I, I'm just wondering about that concern about there being confusion, since that seems to be the standard that courts have already looked at and interpreted. The issue is that. They haven't interpreted Vermont statutes, right? So Vermont has a court is going to look at Vermont's statutes, not necessarily like what other states have done or what, um, you know, what the, the federal government have done. They're, they're, a Vermont court is going to look at the Vermont law and say, <clears throat> all right, we have this definition of, um, of what a child is. It's a person under 16. Then in the simulation section, they added the word actual to that definition. What does that mean? What additionally beyond what is already a real person does that mean? Courts are gonna to have to assign a meaning to that word because that's what they do. That's what they're supposed to do in statutory interpretation. And the concern is that that will go uh, above and beyond what the elements are required. The, um, the elements that are required and essentially be like unpleadable or unprovable because there won't be the, the there won't be any sort of evidence, direct evidence about who specifically this child might be. That's the concern is that it'll raise it beyond to a level beyond what's provable. The Ashcroft limitation um, is not embodied by that mm. word. It's a concept um, that that word refers to. Uh, the word actual is saying this can't be virtual. It can't be some sort of animation. It can't be some sort of uh, computer rendering. Um, that's what that word is referring to. And so in our proposal, we tried to make very clear that we are embodying that Ashcroft directed concept uh, by saying, look, we're gonna make abundantly clear that um, this limitation is there. Again, it was our reading of the law that that limitation was already there um, before this edition, but we're gonna make it abundantly clear that this limitation is there, that we're not talking about paintings or drawings uh, or things like that, that we're talking about simulations of conduct and not simulations of children. Uh, and we're trying to embody that concept uh, without as a matter of Vermont specific statutory interpretation, uh, creating a, a, a unintentionally perhaps, but nevertheless creating a new element that would essentially be unprovable if a court were to uh, interpret it as requiring something beyond what is already required by uh, by the law, which is that it be a real um, child that's being portrayed. 
So I can all go over the language real quick. Um, it is the so it, it's it's looking at subdivision seven uh, in 2821, which is the definition section of uh, this chapter, and. Um, it the first part remains the same. And again, the first part is borrowed from uh, other states. Um, specifically, it's, it's taken fairly closely from New York. And then there's two more sentences that have been added on. <clears throat> and those sentences say, simulations in this subdivision pertain to simulations of the conduct described in subdivisions 2A through F of this section and not to a simulated child. So again, subdivisions 2A through F are the various uh, forms of sexual conduct that are um, types of sexual conduct where, you know, th those are, uh, that forms the definition of what sexual conduct is. And what this sentence is, is clarifying is saying, look, we're talking about simulations of that conduct. Um, we're not talking about a simulated child, a child who is not a real child. Uh, and then the next sentence just sort of it actually borrows language from um, other sections in this chapter, sections 28, 24, and 28, 27, which are the possession and promotion of uh, child sexual abuse materials. And um, it uses language that sort of already exists and imports it into this to again emphasize that we are talking, uh, we are not talking rather about um, things that are not real portrayals. So it says simulations in this subdivision do not include paintings, drawings, or non-visual or written descriptions of sexual conduct. Again, trying to be very clear that um, the concept that is in, um, described in Ashcroft is very clearly written into this and saying, this cannot be something that is criminalized and uh, we're making that abundantly clear in the statute. Um, again, with, you know, I just give the caveat that it has always been our reading of the, of the law that um, because of the limitation created by su uh, subsection one of the definition statute, the definition of a child, it had always been our reading that the limitation required in Ashcroft already existed. Um, but to the extent there's any confusion about that, we're trying to um, make it abundantly clear that that is not behavior that may be criminalized, possession of those types of, uh, you know, of drawings or paintings, that type of, mm. that type of virtual um, image. Thank you. Uh, Selena and then Tom. Well, I originally put my hand down because I actually had the exact same question as Martin, just I think, and that's why I won't ask you know, I won't ask David to answer that again, but was just sort of confused by the notion that um, this would be read really differently from the case law that's out there and, and um, perhaps introduced the requirement for a new degree of specificity. So, but I put my hand back up just because I wanted to say, when the time is right, I would love to hear Michelle address that question if she's willing and able. Yes, yes. Which is not now, I know, but yeah. let's get Tom's question because it may also be a question for Michelle, and then we'll turn to Michelle. Tom. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Um, that's interesting because uh, one of my questions was around case law too, by by having actual in there. But um, but David, I, I'm just kind of curious. Uh, you had your original language, and um, which at the time you seemed you know pretty happy with, and now you've changed it. And uh, I, I guess just your reasoning uh, around why why you you changed some of it. Uh mostly as a good faith gesture to show that we are taking we are trying to take into account everybody's concerns i think that again it, it had been our position that the language as proposed was constitutional uh we understand that there were disagreements about the statutory interpretation um and so we're trying to make abundantly clear that uh there's no intention to be outside of the constitutional limitations in this uh in this proposal and that's why we're we're including that in here. And I I just would say again the um, the word actual is uh, will carry 
will be required by a court to be judged uh, in terms of its meaning within this statute. And it is not necessarily the case that a court is going to say, oh, well, you know, actual must mean what um, the exact same, it must be used the exact same way as a, as some, as a case has used it, um, especially in a situation where um, the limitation, which is that it has to be a real, uh, you know, a, a real child, not a drawing or representation of a child, is already present in the definition of child. It's, and so adding that extra word is, is adding something on, on top of it on top of what's already there, the sort of concept that's already embodied um, by that definition. Um, the, the, the court's gonna be required to give it some meaning. It is not necessarily confined. You know, the word actual is a very common word. It doesn't have any magical connotation. Um, it's, so the court, the court is not necessarily gonna say, oh, well, it must be that it's the, it's, they're using it only in this limited way. They're gonna have to say, they put this in, the definition of child already means, um, you know, our reading is that the definition of child already means that you're talking about a real actual child, a person under 16 is a, you know, a living person under 16. Um, and now they've added another term to that. So what does that, what does that word mean now? What, what, it, it must be something in addition to that. Uh, what Ashcroft is saying that the only thing that can be criminalized is a real actual child, that, that's, the, that's all they're saying. I mean, that's an important limitation. It's, I don't mean to denigrate it. It's essential to First Amendment freedom. But, but that's what they're saying. And then the way that our statute is constructed, adding another word to that, uh, is, is saying more than that, is, is a higher limitation than the one that Ashcroft placed. And, it's not necess and a court may, be, may read it and say, well, I have to give it, you know, it's my obligation as a court to read every word, to have meaning, uh, to have an additional meaning, and therefore I have to give it uh, this phrase a, a uh, some meaning in addition to it being a real, actual child. Um, again, I, uh, the Ashcroft in Ashcroft they use the word actual not because that is like the protector of constitutional rights. They use Ash they use the word actual to refer to a concept. Uh, and we believe that that concept is embodied both in the definition of child uh, as well as now, in addition, the two sentences that are added to the, um, to the end of the simulation definition. Great, and I have, I have one more. So uh, an actual case in Seattle, um, it, it, to me, it doesn't really matter why, uh, but there was a, an accused that took, you know, uh, real pictures and for whatever reason, took the heads off of one picture and, and uh, you know, did the copy and paste whatever uh, and put them onto another body. Um, to me now, after hearing that last night, that, that seems like that could really open a can of worms with actual, if that is, is, could be an actual child since it's, it's two different, it's two different children in a sense. Um, I, I think that argument could probably go either way. And, and that, that's for, uh, for you, David, and also Marshall, maybe you could uh, touch on it when, when you speak and, and Michelle, if you wanted to, uh, um, give your opinion on that also, or what you think it would do um, as far as uh, a, a case goes. But anyway, that, that, that is a, that's a real situation. And, 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 uh, it, and I think that it could uh, um, really create some problems with, by saying actual. I, so I think that's a good point. And I, and I want to not hide the ball here, which is that Ashcroft did in fact make it hard to prove some of these cases. And that's entirely appropriate. That is the line that they drew, the First Amendment line that they drew. And uh, you know, we respect that, that line. Uh, there may be cases when there's digital manipulation of the kind that you're talking about, where it effectively becomes impossible to prove um, that the body that we're talking about is the body of somebody who's under, of a real child who's under 16. That is a reality of the world that, um, 
the, the legal world, I should say, that we are living in. So I don't want to sit here and pretend that these cases are all going to be easy to prove or they're all or that they'll all even be provable. Ashcroft put very real limits on what um, what the state can do. And they do that, did that to protect uh, First Amendment speech. And again, we respect that and understand that that will be the reality that is faced in, in these cases. All right. Thank you. Any other um, questions for David before I turn to Michelle? Okay, so so Michelle, ask you to just to chime in here on sure. the legal questions that we've been um, wrestling with. Sure. So um, so it's been interesting to see the dialogue between Marshall and David, and I know that they've been, they really have taken your request very seriously, and they've had a lot of back and forth over the last week trying to, to settle mm -hmm. on some language that they could both agree to. Um, I'm still where I was earlier, which is that I think that when you read the, the chapter and the definitions, you know, in, in, in concert with one another, I don't have any, I don't personally have concerns around whether or not it's clear that we're talking about an actual child because of the definition that's contained in chapter 64, as well as the title one definition of a person. And we're talking about a natural person. Um, and also I think, you know, everybody's been very, very clear. There's no disagreement amongst the committee or any of the witnesses that simulations are intended to be swept in here. Um, I would agree with David's point on the issue of like when you, you know, you sometimes we add what y'all like to call belts and suspenders, kind of like it's not necessary, but you want to maybe for clarity purposes or highlighting an issue, you want to make sure everybody's really clear on a particular point and you add something, but you do have to be careful that when you add something, even though um, it may only apply to that particular context, the court can read other things into it and say, well, if you have to add actual here, does that mean that in other contexts, it may not mean an actual child because they've specified it here? And so that's kind of where um, it gets a little tricky. And as a drafter, I get a little uncomfortable with adding things that I don't think are absolutely necessary, but I understand people's concerns about wanting to make sure that it's the statute is very clear, um, that it's, uh, um, and then it's not running afoul of Ashcroft. So I feel as though, you know, I think the, the new language that the AG's office proposed is fine and it gets at, I think the concept without using the word actual, I don't personally have as many concerns as the AG's office around using the term actual, um, but you know, I'm not in practice out there litigating these things. And so if they're thinking from a prosecutorial standpoint that they would, that that makes their job a lot harder, you know, that's something for you guys to weigh, but I, I don't, um, it's, I don't have as much concern around the use of it in, terming, in terms of having to prove another element. Mine is more like, well, when we use a word consistently through the statutes and it means this, you know, and then we modify it over here and it insinuates that maybe it doesn't mean that. And so I just don't love to do that if we don't have to. But um, so hopefully uh, that wasn't just more confusing for you. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't, I don't feel, I, I feel like it's fine not to put anything in there. I don't think you do any damage at all by adding the, the AG's latest language um, but, and, 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 and as far as I'm concerned, you could probably use actual and that doesn't, you know, offend me to the same way as it does the prosecutors. But I would say as a middle ground for me, I, you know, add, add the more descriptive language rather than the particular term, if they think that's a stumbling block. But I haven't heard from Marshall about, about this new language from David either. So maybe he can convince me that it stinks and we need to use the actual, um, so. Okay, so before we turn to Marshall, just wanna see if there are any questions for Michelle or for David. 
Uh, Martin. I'm just wondering if uh, this stinks is like a legal terminology that- uh... <laughs> It is in my office. <laughs> okay, all right, all right, thanks. Great, uh, Tom. Thank you. Um, let's see, I gotta find my question in my mess of notes here. Um, I, I guess, uh, where did it go? Okay, is, is there language out there for, from another state that has uh, survived constitutional uh, constitutional challenge around this? Yeah, there's lots of there's lots of uh, statutes. I can look and see, you know, other states and things. You know, what you have to realize though is that it's not just necessarily a a definition or whatever. It's like the whole statutory scheme, so it may be set up differently. Um, okay not necessarily you know apples to apples but if you're interested i can see if i can have an intern look and see what some of the other states language looks like if that's your wish no i, I mean i i just didn't give it enough thought or I, I mean i just don't know i mean when there's uh, uh there's a lot of other stuff that can uh, uh, determine what some final language is and how everything's tied together so uh, no I, i'm good with that yeah. Right. I mean, I think the, the thing is, is that the descriptive language that the AG's office just proposed, while I don't know, I might want to try to play with it or tweak it, but then I don't want to delay it further necessarily, but it, it's a little awkward, but it, but it describes the concept without using the term that they have a concern about. And so I don't know if that still meets Marshall's concerns, um, but it, it seems to, to me, because it's just kind of describing what actual means rather than using the term. Um, but I think all of that's embedded within the existing scheme anyway, so. Sure, I have one more. I think it's for you, Michelle. But um, So if we did use actual, now is, it, is that self-defining? Would we have to define it? Or would, uh, uh, and I think that this is the answer that the definition would be in time determined by the court. Yes, if there was a question about, yes. I mean, I don't, you know, one of those things that if you, so if you say actual child and then you define actual child, are you saying it's a natural person under the age of 16? Well, that's what the law says now. I mean, I don't know, maybe come up with a different term, explanation for actual child. Uh, okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, David, do you want to say anything before we talk to Marshall? I, no, nothing further to add at this point. Thank okay, you. great. Okay. And I know that both of you are, are wanted in Senate Judiciary, so if you disappear, I'll, I'll understand. Uh, Marshall, welcome. Thank you. Um, so I'll start by just saying that I really disagree with David on this um, and to some extent disagree with Michelle and that's around this issue of what you know what do we need to do to make this statute clear actual child is language that's used not just in one Supreme Court case it's used throughout the I mean this is one of the most heavily litigated areas of First Amendment law um, there are literally thousands of cases when you look at both state and federal courts about child pornography and about what must be proven in order to convict somebody for possession or distribution or production of child pornography. And the vast, vast, vast majority of those cases use the language actual child. I tried to find any case where any court had any trouble figuring out what the word actual meant and I found absolutely none of them. However, the, the definition of child that's contained in section 2821, which doesn't say, um, I've heard a couple of people uh, summarize that definition as meaning a natural person under the age of 16 years. It doesn't say that. It says any person under the age of 16 years. And if you wanna look through case law and look at courts debating what the meaning of the word person is, there's tons of cases where they dispute the meaning of the word person. And even in the definition that's provided in Title I, it's obviously that it means more than just person. It can mean an actual person. 
It can mean a corporation. It can mean a municipality. It's a pretty open-ended and broad definition. Uh, so there, it's not that it's as crystal clear in this statutory scheme that person means actual person as it seems. And I think that's reflected when you look at, for example, Professor Teachup, who doesn't really you know, practice in Vermont. And so he steps into this with a sort of outside perspective and looks at this statute. And he came in and his advice was right away, oh, you gotta make sure that it's clear that it requires an actual child, not a simulation of a child. It's not clear enough the way that it's written now. Um, I don't think this committee got the benefit last year of hearing from a woman who's an attorney for uh, children who have been victims of child pornography, but she testified in the Senate and said essentially the same thing, said when you guys put simulation in here, it's not clear that what you mean is simulation that involves an actual child. And I would change that so that it's clear that it meant actual child. So I think that having language in there that reflects that what we're talking about is an actual child, a simulated act performed on an actual child is important. And it's not just me saying that, it's Professor Teachout, it's uh, the woman, I forgot her name, she was the representative from an organization that represents victims of child pornography and sexual exploitation. And it just reflects what, you know, the vast, vast majority, uh, I would say even an overwhelming majority of the case law uses that same terminology. I don't understand where the AG's office gets the idea that this is going to confuse a judge into thinking it means something that it doesn't when there is so much case law out there that says actual child means real child in the context of uh, child pornography prosecution. And I think that, you know, it was almost telling that uh, when David was trying to explain what the concept was, he was unable to explain the concept without using the word actual child in the explanation. Now to get to the language that David's proposed, I actually think the language that he's proposed, if I'm reading it correctly, more or less accomplishes what I'm after. Um, I, that doesn't mean that I think it's a good idea. I think that language is horribly unclear. It's essentially a definition of the word simulation that uses the word simulation three times in the definition of the word simulation. So it's, it's just really awkward. And what I don't understand is the resistance to just saying actual child. It's what every court says when we talk about this. It's what all the case law says when we talk about this. And I'm unable to find a case anywhere where any court has been confused into thinking that actual child requires some level of proof beyond simply proving that the child is an actual child. Um, you know, it's, it's a straightforward meaning. Uh, you know, nobody seems confused in this committee or uh, at the US Supreme Court or in any of the other places where this language has been discussed, um, nobody seems confused by the term actual child. No court in a published decision seems to be confused about the term actual child. And so I guess I'm confused as to where this like worry that there's gonna be a court that just can't make sense of actual child comes from, particularly when the alternative is a definition that necessarily incorporates the definition of the word person, which has been the subject of a lot of litigation. And in a lot of cases, uh, courts are looking at the word person in the context of a statute saying, uh, in this statute, does the word person mean natural person? Does it mean person including corporation? Does it mean person including the government? You know, there's a lot of litigation about that and about the particular meaning of the word person in a given statute. So to me, um, you know, honestly, if the language that David proposed passes, do I think that that necessarily makes the law unconstitutional? No, I think it makes it less clear than it could be if we use the language that everybody else uses when we discuss this concept that everyone else discusses. Um, 
So, you know, to me, we're, we've moved away from a question of, is this language constitutional? And moved into a better place, which is, what's the most clear and sensible way to draft this? And honestly, that's where I really depart from David's perspective, because I cannot, you know, I feel like if there was case law out there where courts were confused by the word actual, David would have brought it here to make the point. I can't find it. I don't understand what the, where the speculation comes from. Um, so to me, you know, the better language would be right in the definition section to just simply change the definition of child so that it means any actual child under the age of 16 years. I don't know why we wouldn't do that, but if it doesn't go that way, do I think we made the bill unconstitutional? Probably not, just less clear and less tied to the case law that really defines the, the boundaries of the statute. So, so I continue to support language that uses the words actual child and not to support the language that's been proposed but this language as it's proposed now, probably constitutional. I think it's just bad language. Okay, all right. Well, <laughs> getting closer. Uh, see two hands, uh, Felicia and then Selena. Okay, so I have a question and it kind of stems uh, from Michelle's point that her concern with using the word actual would not only be any kind of higher standard that prosecution might have to prove that David's point was, uh, but the court reading actual in this context into other statutes and into, into other instances where it wasn't intended. Is there a way to clean up the definitions and kind of hit all birds with a single stone? by creating its own definition for the word actual um, and then linking that back to the definition we're currently using. So that if I am looking up, why did they use actual? If a court is looking that up, they can find that and then find the direct link back to the current definition. Um, and that would kind of tie it in a way that it wouldn't be open to interpretation or am I kind of wishing there? So I, I think it's for Michelle, is if we did that, would it accomplish kind of meeting everybody's I think, um, right, no, I think, so when, when we have definitions in a chapter, the lead in language will say, as used in this chapter. So, and we, and we do have different, throughout the title, sometimes the same word will have different meanings in different titles or chapters, you know, so there are some that are common. So you have like in what we were talking about the definition of person, which is in title one. So there's a, there's some general terms that are used throughout the statutes that will generally term, but they may say for purposes of this chapter, it's going to mean something different. I think okay. you know, the thing is, is that, and so we do do that and it applies to that chapter and you don't necessarily apply that anywhere else. You go to the default or, or you look at the whole construction of the chapter. Um, it's more about uh, trying to uh, be careful about not creating a different definition if it's really not any different. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So like if it's actually yeah. the same thing, don't describe it differently in two different places. Um, but, you know, for me, a lot of, I think this, uh, between the, the Defender General's office and the AG's office, I hate to tell you guys, I think is really a policy decision for you guys, because um, from, a, from a legal standpoint, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I think it's fine, not specifically either describing actual child or putting it in there because I think it's taken care of on, with the underlying, but I also understand that this is a topic of debate and people want to make sure that they're really clear and there's a there's a disagreement between the two stakeholders that are working on this. So um, I think it's really going to be just up to y'all. I think 
like I said, the the language is a little, and no disrespect to David, and I'm guessing he probably didn't even write it anyway, but the 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 language at the AG's office, you know, was tr trying to meet a lot of needs there of different people probably being careful about how they structure it is that it's a little awkward, you know, I could maybe try to play with it a little bit and see if I could get something that still captures that, that's, that's agreeable to the parties. Um, that would be fine with me, but also, I again, I don't have the same extent of concerns as the AG's office with regard to just using actual child for all the reasons that Marshall said too. So, you know, if you want to be a little on the safer side and uh, give some deference to the litigators in the AG's office that, that they feel as though it would be much harder for them if it had in there, you can just go with the description. If you're not as concerned about that, you know, you, we can add the actual child into the definition. Okay. I didn't know if for purposes of redundancy, instead of describing it differently in two different places, it would just be redundant, like a synonym to define it as it is and then Right. Child. Yeah. I kind of don't control. want to just, I don't want, yeah, it, it would be weird to, to describe, to, to define actual child because it's really just what I think it is under the current law anyway. So <laughs> I think, okay. um, so. Or it has to be a policy decision. It's not something we're cleaning up in definitions. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with the current definitions. It's more okay. about, so I think it's really, you know, I hadn't, it's interesting to think about the way the AG's office did it, which is describing, you know, focusing on the simulation rather on kind of redefining child for purposes of the statute. Okay, I think that's the only question I had. Thank you. Felicia, are you also wondering, because it's something that I've been thinking about too, about just referencing um, yeah. the definition, not not saying it again or, or repeating it in any way, but just saying something like as defined in, what is it, 13, BSA 2321. You know, I don't know if that would confuse things or help things, but is that, is that sort of what you were thinking? Yeah, that's kind of where I was targeting is like, instead of like gumming everything up, just have it reference a definition that we can all agree on and, and move forward. But yeah, that's kind of where I was coming from. You can, again, you can add that. Uh, You know, it's we typically just don't do that because the definitions are right there in the first section. And so, you know, to kind of be like, oh, what's a child? I'm going to look in the definitions. But you could do that. You could also, you know, if actual is an issue, I don't know, maybe it would be OK for both stakeholders if you just said if you just tweaked the child definition to make it clear that it's a natural person under the age of 18. I don't know if that helps and this may be middle of the road. Um, if... Yeah. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, I'm sorry, I'm not sure of the order, but I'm just gonna go with uh, Tom, Martin, and Selena. I, I think Selena was ahead of me. Okay, all right, thank you. Selena. Oh, thanks. Um, so, oh, sorry. So this is actually a question back directed back to Marshall. Um, so is the the Defender General's position that the is the only thing that you all are asking for a change to just the definition, and would it then read "child" means any actual person under sixteen years of age? Or is there additional language that your office is looking for? That's all. I prefer the language means an actual child under the age of 16 years, just because actual child is the language that, you know, every court that looks at these cases uses. Um, but with that said, I mean, actual person probably more or less the same thing. Again, I just don't see, I don't see a reason to stray away from the language that every court uses. I mean, especially if the concern is how is a court going to interpret this language? Why not use the language that every court has already interpreted to mean exactly what we want it to mean? Okay, great. I just wanted to make sure I was 
really understanding the specificity of your recommendation. So that, that was helpful. Thank you. Okay. Tom and then Martin. Yeah, uh, Marshall, can you just touch on the uh, uh, the question that I had asked David about uh, the, the uh, if we did go to actual uh, uh, if if it would affect something like the uh, electronic manipulation of pacing a head on a body? It wouldn't affect that because there's already so we don't have a second circuit decision on that, but nearly every other uh, federal circuit court has already ruled on that exact issue, um, and there's unanimity among the federal circuit courts that you cannot criminalize the possession of a picture of an, even if it's an actual and identifiable child's head morphed onto the body of an adult performing a sexual act, that that can't be criminalized because the child, there was not actually child abuse in the making of the image. Um, so I think no matter how you draft the statute, you're not going to capture that. In fact, if you draft a, draft the statute specifically with the intent of capturing that, you would probably render your whole statute unconstitutional um, because there's, you know, maybe not in the Second Circuit because we don't actually have a case from the Second Circuit yet. Uh, but every other circuit that's weighed in on it has said, yeah, that's, you know, that's, I think every every circuit uses the same language. They all say it's morally repugnant, but constitutionally protected. Um, right. So I don't think you can alter that either way with this definition. Right. No. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, so the new language that David has, you said it is better. It's getting getting closer. The, the, not your exact words, but. And it, uh, apparently it, it's a little, I'm guessing it's a little wordy for you. <laughs> and I, yeah. I didn't know, what's that? Nothing, go ahead, sorry, I thought okay. you were... <laughs> No, um, and so I, I didn't know if there's something to work, work from there, uh, if you and David got together with that language, if, if that could be, uh, uh, um, changed or, or you you know between the two of you working on that where it could get you even uh, closer uh, you know honestly I doubt it and I say that because like I said we no longer with this language we no longer feel that it would make the statute unconstitutional it just comes down to what's a better way to do this is it to use the language that everybody uses all over the country that they use in all the decisions that have interpreted these, you know, the, the bounds of the constitution in these cases, or is it to invent our own language and say, we're Vermont, we're gonna make up our own language. And I'm always gonna fall on the side of, let's just say actual child, because that's what we mean. Even David says that's what we mean. And that's what the, that's what the federal courts, the Supreme Court, that's what, that's what basically everybody who looks at this, that's the language they use. So. You know, I'm not going to agree that I think it's a better idea to use language that diverges from that when we could instead use language that's consistent with that. Great, thank you. Uh, Martin. Well, I did have a question, but I think I, I, I instead I'm going to make a comment. Um, so, I mean, I, I agree with, uh, with Marshall, frankly, on this. I think we can use the language that we have from David and in the sentence uh, where it says, and not to a simulated child, just change that to, uh, of this section with a, an actual child and keep the last sentence that's added there because it does add some further clarity. I, it just seems, it seems pretty straightforward to me ultimately uh, at this point. And, I, and I'm just not buying that it's gonna be confusing for the courts in the state to figure out what actual child means. I really just don't. So. I think we should change that one bit and, and move on with this. The question I was going to have, though, and I just don't know that it's really relevant at this point, is a rule of statutory construction, which uh, in, if there's any kind of ambiguity, which I guess probably there isn't at this point, uh, it's supposed to be read in a, a defendant's favor. And, and I, I guess I had a question of whether this is ambiguous as it is, but I'm hearing from Marshall, it isn't necessarily ambiguous. But that's what I... 
that's what I would throw out there is just change that and not to a simulated child to with an actual child and, and move on. So just to respond to that, you know, you're, you're referring to the rule of lenity. My experience with the rule of lenity is that things have to be actually very, very ambiguous as in nobody, like everybody reads the, you know, the section of law and nobody can tell what it means before courts will apply the rule of lenity. Um, I've argued the rule of lenity a bunch of times. I've never gotten a court to agree with me that whatever it is I'm pointing to is actually ambiguous. Um, they always say there's no need to reach the rule of lenity because it's clear what the intent of the law was and that's what we're gonna go with. We're not gonna, we're not gonna cut the defendant a break in any case. Um, I know there are rule of lenity cases out there, but they are few and far between and they really are usually reserved for places where either a statute is essentially incomprehensible or more commonly where statutes are just silent, where there's no language. Um, so we don't have, so it's not really an issue here, but I guess I'd still stand with just uh, that, that straightforward change to the language that uh, Amy's provided. Um, that's, where I, that's where I'm at at least. Yeah, so um, Selena, before I turn to you, David, I'd like you to, um, to respond to Martin's comment. If that's any different than what your concern is of by putting it here in this language, is it any, um, does that still not possibly make you prove another element or, or does it work in here? I have to look and think about it a little more carefully, but my initial response is that it does raise, it, it still would raise the same concern that our office has with respect to um, it potentially introducing another element. I'll just say two things really quickly here, because I think the, the points have been made on both sides of the argument, but I think um, point one is that it is the case that uh, that that terminology is often used around the country and other courts. The concern from our office is that these are going to be Vermont courts interpreting a Vermont statute in the context of other parts of that statute. And that that is what raises the concern, not so much that, um, it, you know, it's not about like common language or what's been done elsewhere, but what very specifically uh, might be done under the pressure of litigation here, trying to understand what new uh, extra words mean. The other point I'll make, it, but again, I think that point's been made and argued. The, the other point, I'll, the other piece that I wanted to bring up is I think, you know, we would be open to uh, seeing what Attorney Childs' tweaks might be. She is the professional statutory drafter, um, not us. And while I can't guarantee we're going to agree with whatever comes up, whatever comes out of there, I certainly am happy to um, let somebody who's a professional in statutory drafting uh, take a crack at tweaking what we put and, and making it something that might um, uh, make more sense from her professional vantage point. And just wanted to express openness to that. Great. Thank you. Um, Selena and then Tom. Um, yeah, I just had a question for Marshall about Martin's suggestion. Oh, sorry. I, somebody's getting really good at lowering my hand for me <laughs> before I get to it. Um, so the, I think Martin, Martin's proposing, Martin, I understood you to be proposing, proposing not changing the definition, but just including the words actual child in the, in the statutory, in the statutory, in the other language in that provision and and again and it's in counter or it's with that last sentence which i think it makes it very clear that we're we're just being really clear that in this context we're talking about an actual child not you know paintings drawings etc i think it's in combination with that last sentence that it takes away these concerns about what we're talking about when we're talking about an actual child so just to be clear so Marshall, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that because I think that is a little bit different from what you all have been proposing. It is a bit different, but it's fine. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that still applies the, the, the words actual child to the definition of uh, that, that's contained within the simulation section. So that works for me. I, again, you know, I think the easy way to do it is just to drop uh, actual child into the definition of child, but six of one half dozen of the other. It just makes it a little more complex. 
Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, Tom. Thank you. Um, so <laughs> it's interesting how, you know, uh, in and very short bills at times when uh, there's there's so much discussion around uh, you know one word, and uh, sometimes it's shall and may and uh, and and here it's you know it's around actual, and I mean being a layperson, um, I, and everything I've heard, I, I do like the definition with actual in there. I, I don't know where. I don't know how. Uh, uh, Martin's uh, suggestion certainly uh, incorporates, uh, um, you know, language from both sides, um, and it, and it just crossed my mind you know, just before I raised my hand that I feel like I'm getting away from um, what we're trying to do here, and and the bottom line is we're trying to protect children. And, and I think uh, uh, whether we use uh, the AG's uh, language or, or the Defender General's language, um, or uh, it, now Martin has, you know, uh, brought it, brought, kind of brought forward some language that incorporates both, that uh, the language protects children. Um, so, and, and that's, to me, that's the main thing is, is to, you know, to protect the children, you know, I mean, I mean, you can't get any more vulnerable than a, than a three-year-old. And, and, um, and I guess, I guess where I'm going ultimately is, uh, is supporting the language that, that Martin uh, suggested. I, I think it, it, it just takes into account um, everybody who's been working so hard on this, um, you know, and uh, that's, that's the language I, I would definitely um, um, support. Thanks. Okay, well, I, I appreciate, oops, sorry. <laughs> Somebody else wants my attention. Um, so Tom, I appreciate that. Um, however, I also appreciate what the Attorney General's off, um, office or David is saying on behalf of his office. And um, in order to protect children, we need a statute that prosecutors will actually use to protect children. And so I'm, so I'm, I'm concerned about, um, about their concern with, it, um, with using actual. So what I would like is for Michelle to um, ask us to take a pause on this right now. And I'd like Michelle um, to tweet David's language um, and uh, come back with um, with some, you know, share it with Marshall and David. Um, but come back to our to our committee, and uh, and see where we land. And uh, Michelle, maybe you and I can can meet briefly. Sure. At the committee. So so just going with the concept that the AG's office has through the description, but not using the term actual child. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yep. And sure. seeing if a reference as defined in 13 VSA 2321, if that works or if that's too clunky, then maybe not, but, um, but yeah, yep. Um, sure. Wait. So, okay. Um, all right, and then, okay. and then, and then we'll have um, committee discussion, but I would like to, I would like to see more language before we, you know, before we open it up further. Uh, Martin. Yeah, I just want to make sure just one thing you said, and, and what I've been hearing from, from David as well, is there's concern that a court might interpret actual as, I don't know, requiring to identify the particular actual, you know, the child by name or something like that, uh, which I, I'm just not buying, frankly, uh, from what other courts have said and what I've read of, of other cases. But I want to understand is it's is it a question of whether the prosecutors will bring these kind of cases because if that's the case that's a whole different issue for me I mean if if uh, prosecutors are going to be concerned that they aren't sure that this is an actual child or if it's simulation or whatnot uh, then yeah I'm I'm willing absolutely to go with what the AG is saying but I 
don't think that's what they're saying, but let me hear from David uh, as far as that's concerned. I mean, is it gonna, uh, get, going back to Tom, what Tom said, you know, this is about protecting these children in these situations. And if having the word actual in there is somehow gonna lessen that protection because prosecutors are gonna be concerned about bringing the cases, you know, I, I, I would have a big problem with that. I'll, I'll let me say this, if, if it, if the word actual is incorporated in such a way that it, there's an argument there that it's adding another element beyond what, uh, beyond simply a real child, um, there is a distinct chance that they will not attempt to bring cases because they, in, in almost every case, because they would not have sufficient information to plead that. Um, so, so they are concerned that uh, if it's included in a way that are, that adds an element, that arguably adds an element, that they would not bring cases. Obviously, we have to see exact proposals to make. Um, the, the details really matter on this stuff. <laughs> We'd have to see exact proposals to see if we're uh, walking over that line. And, and you think we're walking over that line if we change that and not to a simulated child to with an actual child with that next sentence as a, a further explainer. You think that that's still problematic? My initial response is that it's very likely to be, but I also, it is slightly different, I will say, than it uses slightly different wording than the, a lot of what Marshall and I were discussing uh, and Michelle were discussing. So uh, let me um, let me take that back. But my, my uh, initial response is that it is likely to elicit the same concern. But again, I do want to the, you know, the, the exact words do matter, and I, I would want to bring that back. All right, thanks. Um, I thought I saw Tom's hand up. It's now down. I just, Tom, I want to make sure you don't have any. Nope. Um, yeah, I had it up. I took it down. I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. All right. So it sounds like, David, you'll bring back uh, today's discussion to your office, right, and see if, if Martin's proposal um, is different and uh, does not go more, you know, towards inserting another element of the of the crime. And then Michelle also, um, you'll tweak in um, David's language and work with with David and Marshall. And uh, and then we'll it'll be up to us to make the policy decision. So okay, so I think, folks, I am going to. Um, Let's see, I was going to adjourn at 3.30 because I have a um, meeting and then, uh, yeah, so why don't we do that? We'll adjourn early um, and uh, hopefully I would like to continue on this bill, you know, this week and bring it to closure. It'd be nice if we could get a vote on this. So anyway, okay. So um, um, Maxine, when do you think we would be uh, possibly taking a vote? And the reason being, is if we get any amount of snow tonight, which we're potentially going to, I will be plowing in the morning. Okay, yeah, let me look at, um, so we do have it. So tomorrow we, we just have it for a half an hour. Um, I am hoping, I don't know, David, if you're, if you're able to come back with, um, with feedback. Um, and Michelle, I don't know if that gives you time, but that is- what, I, I don't I have a note, I don't have a notice for it. When is, what time is that? Um, it's at nine o'clock. We won't be voting at nine o'clock tomorrow. I can I can say that for sure because I like to give the committee generally twenty four hours, and I don't think you know we still have more discussion, so we're not close to a vote. But um, um, I can. I think it's more just an issue of that I need to be able. To, you know, I'm going to try to come up with something, send it to Marshall and David. David has, you know, they both have to check with their people, then they have to send it back to me. It, I don't, I don't know if just the back and forth, if that sure. gives us yeah. enough time for that. Okay. Um, right. So, right. Um, yeah, that's fine. So I'm looking there. Um, I don't, um, we're going to be discussing um, H20. We also, um, we have the budget adjustment when we made the schedule, we didn't know exactly when the budget adjustment is, but I think it's it's going to be Thursday and Friday, correct? So, yeah. so anyway, so I'm not really answering the uh, question unless we can insert this. I say later later in the week, um, either 
either tomorrow afternoon or, or Thursday morning. Let's see where we are. I have time. I'm in another committee all afternoon tomorrow, but I, I do have some time Thursday morning. Yeah, we do have it again on Thursday morning. Oh, you do? Okay. We do have it on our schedule. So. Okay. What, what time on Thursday? It is at, let's see. Um, looks like it's right after H20, so 9.30ish. Um, does that okay. work for you? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Mike Bailey, can you send me a meeting notice? Um, Will do. Yeah. I mean, you know, David, if you're able to give us a very, very quick update on H20, that might help people think about kind of where we are on that and, and move that along quicker. Thanks, Michelle. Sure. I do have to drop off very soon, yep. but I will give a very quick uh, summary. H20, to remind everybody, is the bill about pretrial services. I think that the um, idea, the sense of the group that is emerging is to have to essentially remove risk assessments from the pretrial services statute entirely, except that a judge it, it will, uh, judges will retain discretion to request that a pretrial services, um, or sorry, that a risk assessment be performed by a pretrial services caseworker. The idea there is that it basically eliminates the use in almost all cases, which addresses some of the concerns around bias that underlies uh, risk assessments. It would also remove discretion from caseworkers um, where the prior language arguably gave caseworkers or did give caseworkers the sort of arbitra arbitrary power to decide who might get one and who might not. But if there is an unusual circumstance or what I think would likely be an unusual circumstance where a judge feels like they would be assisted by, um, by, the, uh, by somebody getting a risk assessment, and again, it would be a risk assessment solely for a risk of flight, which is all that we do now, uh, that option would remain available. Okay. And David, will you be bringing us language reflecting that? Yeah, I'll work with uh, Attorney Fitzpatrick on that. I, I will probably largely leave to him the execution of the concept of that, but I will work with him on um, trying to make that into legislative language. Okay, great. Any questions for David before we let him go? About that. Okay. All right. Thanks, David. Thank so, um, so given that we're not going to get back to eighteen tomorrow morning, Martin, are you able to start um, earlier, or do you have um, do you have a meeting? No, I, I'm good. I'm good to start. So, so uh, okay. So, why don't we do that at nine o'clock? We'll do, we'll start with um, H eighty seven. Okay. So am I going to get the like the health benefits that the uh, uh, legislative council gets uh, if I present the bill? <laughs> well, um, okay. And then uh, yeah, and then I'll look over the schedule again and and um, you know put in when we'll be on the floor with budget adjustment. I'm not sure how long it's going to the bill is going to take. I don't know if any anybody knows, but if you could let me know. But so. So our schedule may be tweaked a little bit. And then I know Selena, you're um, working on the summary and, um, and so we can fit that in as, as well. So, okay. And I'm gonna be meeting with um, DCF soon, talk about some interests that they have in terms of child support. And I'm also going to um, talk about, um, Bob, your, your questions about, um, uh, rule of evidence and, and uh, see if they have any thinking on that. So, all right.